ओम ज्ञान तिमिरंदस्य ज्ञानांजनि शलाकाय चक्षुरुन मिलतमेन तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः सो थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर जॉइनिंग टुडे एंड टुडे विल बी डिस्कसिंग बेस्ड ऑन द भगवत गीता आवर कंटिन्यू गीता कोर्स विल बी डिस्कसिंग ऑन a topic for which the bhagavad gita has a significant amount of uh, insightful things to say and that's a topic which is of great human relevance for all of us so the seventh chapter of the bhagavad gita is called knowledge of the absolute and the verse this is can sex be spiritual what is the difference between lust and love these two questions we'll discuss primarily how does sex relate with spirituality this is 711 बलम बलवताम चाहम कामराग विवर्जित धर्मो भूतेशु कामोस्मी भरत सो कृष्णा सेज वेरियस थिंग्स ओवर हियर आई एम स्ट्रेंथ अमॉन्ग द स्ट्रॉन्ग एस्पेशली द स्ट्रेंथ दैट इज डिवॉइड ऑफ काम राग विवर्जित दैट इज फ्री फ्रॉम वन जोन अटैचमेंट एंड वन जोन क्रेविंग्स पैशन and and similarly dharma viruddho bhuteshu kamosmi bharatarshabha i am kama i am the sex that is not contrary to religious principles so dharma aviruddho bhuteshu that which is not contrary so what is going on over here in this particular section of the bhagavad gita will be having essentially a three th- uh, basically let's try to understand the flow of these chapters how it is going And from the uh, till the sixth chapter krishna's focus was on detachment from the world and by detaching oneself from the world how can one attach oneself to a uh, spiritual reality and culminating in the ultimate spiritual reality krishna so 647 was the verse which talked about how among all the yogas the topmost yoga is that by which one fixes the mind on krishna yogi naam api sarvesham madgate nantar atmana shraddhavan bhajate yo mam samay yukta tamo matah so if you want to envision the gita's flow it's a gradual inclination upward from where we are from our level of consciousness to the highest level of consciousness then they going by a very gradual way to the top and this gradual way involves two steps first is detachment from matter and gradually attachment to krishna and first of all we understand attachment to the spiritual essence within us and ultimately to the attachment to the spiritual essence of the whole universe now after describing this gradual process of rise raising our consciousness toward krishna then the gita offers us another way of attaining that summit of our consciousness and that mood from the 7th chapter onward is significantly different what is that mood that mood is that krishna is telling the first verse itself mai asatta manaha partha yogam yunjan madashraya asamshayam samagrammam yatha gyasya sita shrunu so mai asatta manaha partha make your mind attached to me and how can you make your mind attached to me that is the process i will describe to you so rather than focusing too much on detaching one's mind from at matter then understanding what is spirit and then becoming uh, focus on the spirit krishna is giving a different process over here so if somebody is carrying a heavy stone and uh, or a, a bag filled with stones you may tell them you know just put down this bag uh, or somebody is carrying a maybe a pouch filled with stones which is just a burden then you just put down that bag and then go ahead and find out something valuable to carry maybe there's a bag filled with uh, jewels then pick it up uh, so there's a two steps detachment from matter and attachment to spirit but these two could be integrated say if i see a bag full of jewels then i can i can as i move move toward take my hand toward that i release what i'm holding in my hand my focus is not on releasing what i am holding my focus is on catching hold of that but as i try to catch as i open my hand to catch hold of that bag as i open my hand to catch hold of that bag naturally the other bag which i am carrying the bag of stones falls aside 
so the point over here is the bhagavad gita 7th chapter onward focuses on what we are meant to become attached to rather than what we are meant to become detached from and if you have to become attached to krishna now how do we become attached to him the bhagavad gita's vision is that see krishna as pervading all of the existence see that he is present in all existence so in the previous session we discussed about sutre mani gana eva how is the underlying thread of truth and one thing that captivates our mind today is science science and its product in the form of technology so we discussed how through science and technology also we can see how these can be integrated with life's ultimate purpose uh, we discussed in the previous session how science helps us to make things better spirituality helps us to make people better so from the gita's perspective the idea is the gita is now offering us not a world rejecting way to spirituality but a world encompassing way to spirituality a world engaging way to spirituality world rejecting means detach yourself from matter and then attach yourself to to the spirit but here see that spirit also pervades matter that matter can also be used for spiritual growth that is the mood of the gita so after 7 7 where krishna says sutre mani gana eva i am the thread underlying thread of truth that pervades all of existence then krishna starts giving examples of how he is the thread of truth so everything has a certain defining essences and krishna says i am the essence of various things so for example he says that asoham apsu konteya prabhasmi shashi surya yo pranava sarva vedeshu shabda khe paurusham drishu so he says for example that i am ability in people now people are multifaceted creatures but we are all defined distinguished by our abilities so that so what if you think about some special person say we think about um, a, a cricketer like sachin tendulkar or a tennis player like <clears throat> say roger federer or we think of a great artist like uh, great sculptor like michael angelo or a great artist like van gogh or whatever a uh, musician like mozart now what do we think about we think about their ability so often people are distinguished by their ability so the essence what distinguishes them what characterizes them that krishna says i am that essence and how krishna pervades all of existence as the underlying thread of truth krishna gives various examples of that and the last excerpt from 7 8 to 7 11 in four verses he gives various examples and one such example is what he is giving over here where he states that he is the person who is who is it is he who is exper who manifests as various transformative agents in this world so balam balavatam chaham so strong people that strength he says i am that strength but not all strength now there are right now <clears throat> there are riots going on in america so now these people are using their political power or crowd power or whatever so krishna that, that kind of power is not him it is balam balavatam chaham kam raga vivarjitam where it is free from attachment where it is free from selfish desire and uh, that means power is quite a important thing in this world power but how is it used so when it is used for doing some good in society then that power krishna says i am that and similarly dharma aviruddho bhuteshu kamosmi bharat arshab so i am desire kama that which is not contrary to dharma which is not contrary to the principles of virtue so now karma can so kama can refer specifically to sexual desire generically it can refer to any desire and today we will focus on the sexual aspect of it and later on i'll talk about the other aspects of karma in a future session but i'll just mention it here in the vedic tradition there were four primary purposes of life dharma artha kama and moksha so one performs virtuous actions 
by which one can get financial resources and then one can fulfill one's desires. Once one fulfills one's desires, then one can eventually realize that fulfillment of desires doesn't fulfilling desires doesn't lead to fulfillment. Therefore, they start pursuing liberation, the moksha. So now, <clears throat> the pursuit of artha and karma of uh, of wealth and pleasure, specific sensual pleasure, that has to be regulated by dharma. That has to be grounded in dharma. So Krishna is saying, not any sensual desire is a manifestation of the divine, but sensual desire that is not contrary to the principles of dharma, that is a manifestation of the divine. So let's try to understand what are the implications of this particular declaration by Krishna. And we'll be discussing three parts today. So how to see everything in the light of life's ultimate purpose how to think, deal with things that divert us from life's purpose and how to harmonize things with life's purpose. So now we have discussed earlier, what is life's ultimate purpose? It is spiritual evolution, the development of the soul's eternal loving connection with the Supreme soul Krishna. All of life is meant for us to evolve spiritually, to move toward uh, strengthening and deepening and broadening our connection with Krishna. And for that purpose, uh, the Bhagavad Gita 7 chapter onwards, it is going to focus on an inclusive vision, how the various activities of this world can also be used for that purpose. That's what is going to be discussed in this section now. So then Krishna said earlier, Sutre Mani Gana Eva. That he is the underlying unifying thread of truth. So Krishna's all pervasiveness means that we can connect with Krishna through everything, even the things that seem to disconnect us from him. So basically Krishna is the all pervading ultimate reality. So we can connect with him through everything. That is one of the principles that the Gita is going to teach that uh, fixing the mind on Krishna doesn't just mean rejecting the world and focusing on Krishna. It also means engaging with the world in a mood of service to Krishna. Even the things that seem to disconnect us from him. So what does, what are the things that might disconnect us from him? So, this is a principle that the Gita will elaborate more specifically in the 10th chapter. The 7th chapter and the 10th chapter are somewhat similar. 7th chapter is titled by Srila Prabhupada in his Gita as Knowledge of the Absolute. And Prabhupada chapters that title the 10th chapter as Knowledge of the Absolute. So it's, uh, sorry, it's called the 10th chapter as the Opulence of the Absolute. So the same points you're talking in the 7th chapter will be elaborated further in especially the 9th and the 10th chapters. So one of the concluding verse of the 10th chapter says, Yad yad vibhuti mat sattvam shri madurjitam evava tatta devava gachatvam mama tejo amsha sambhava mama tejo amsha sambhava That everything attractive manifests a spark of my splendor. Everything attractive. So whatever it is that we find attractive in this world, it, where does it get it gets its attraction from? It is actually by, it is Krishna who is all attractive and who has infused that thing with a spark of his attraction. So let's see what is the practical implication of this. So there are many things which may distract us. For example, sports may distract us, movies may distract us, novels may distract us, news may distract us. But let's consider one thing. Say if somebody considers... Uh, say novels like say the Harry Potter novels or the Hunger Game novels or whatever now is happening. So now is current. Now when people get captivated by that, somebody who is not captivated, they may say, what is there? Why are you spending so many hours and days and weeks in discussing this? In, in what, is, what is there so special about it? So the point is that what is special is that they are experiencing a spark of Krishna through it. And not everybody, others may not be experiencing that spark of Krishna through it. 
so because they are experiencing a spark of krishna that's why they are so captivated by it say indians are captivated by cricket but for americans those who do not know so much about indian culture cricket might remind them more of a insect than a sport and if you what is so great about cricket why are so mad about it but americans might be mad after baseball so here the principle is that you know, the drops so if we consider krishna to be like a ocean and there are drops so all of us perceive different drops of krishna and we drops of that o krishna ocean and we feel attracted to them and when we are attracted to them the attractive potency of that particular thing comes ultimately from krishna so let's try to understand this with a metaphor now yeah so imagine if somebody is in a desert and they are going towards a ocean or an oasis so when they are going towards that ocean suppose so you can see three arrows in three different directions one going towards the ocean another going away from the ocean and one just going laterally parallel to the ocean so what do we mean over here suppose along this path where you see the arrows there are some drops of water over there now what may happen on seeing such drops is the person may say oh i am thirsty i need some water so let me look for this water and in looking for that water they start pursuing that water and they start moving in that direction so now all the water in the vicinity of in the desert which is in the vicinity of their ocean or that oasis where has it come from that water has come from the ocean itself but not all those drops will take that person toward the ocean if there was a stormy wind and because of that the water came some water got swept and there are drops which are in the direction say you can see the red arrows over there the red arrows indicate that you know those drops are in a direction which is opposite to the ocean so if somebody starts chasing those drops then they will not go closer to the ocean or if somebody chases starts chasing after the drops or starts taking the path shown by the drops which are parallel to the ocean the black arrows which you see over there then again that person will not get to the ocean why not because they are basically uh, getting uh, those drops are not taking them toward the ocean it's only the white draw the white arrows the drops in that direction which will take them toward the ocean so just the presence of water the presence of drops of water indicates the presence of a ocean but the direction in which the arrows of uh, uh, the drops are present that doesn't necessarily indicate that is the direction where the water is so what does this mean for us practically the everything attractive comes from krishna but everything attractive doesn't always take us to krishna the source and destination may not always be the same if something attracts us toward krishna or uh, something we find attractive that doesn't necessarily mean that it is going to take us toward krishna it may take us away from krishna also we have to so that's why we have to know what is life's ultimate purpose and then we see how whatever we are doing it reflects or where which direction we are going whether that is taking us toward life's ultimate purpose or that is taking us away from life's ultimate purpose to the extent we can see that to that extent we can act with properly so just because i feel attracted to it so should i do, do should i do this well not necessarily even if we understand that okay i'm feeling attracted to this because i'm attracted to krishna or rather this is a manifestation of krishna well it is a manifestation of krishna but is it going to take me toward krishna that is something which we have to consider so you know we need to become conscious of krishna in the things that make us unconscious of krishna so for example suppose somebody is an alcoholic and as soon as they think of a bottle of alcohol they just get captivated by it. when can i drink it and they drink it and then they they maybe get into a alcohol induced induced 
stupor and then they fall asleep, maybe fall unconscious or then they have a hangover and through all that process, they're not conscious of Krishna at all. So is that alcohol Krishna? Well, alcohol is not Krishna, but the capacity of that alcohol to attract someone, that capacity is actually a spark of Krishna. Now, Prabhupada said that if somebody cannot give up alcohol, he said this on, on in his book called On the Way to Krishna, then they can think that the taste of alcohol is Krishna. And by thinking that the taste of alcohol is Krishna, what will happen? They will remember Krishna. And by such remembrance of Krishna, they will one day become devotees of Krishna. They'll become attracted to Krishna. So it's not by drinking alcohol that they will go toward Krishna, rather by remembering Krishna. That this capacity of alcohol to attract comes from Krishna. And it will take me toward Krishna if I if I choose, uh, a, if I remember Krishna. So that's why normally alcohol makes somebody unconscious of Krishna. But, but rather than simply getting captivated by it, if one thinks, you know, okay, what is it that is captivating me so much? Well, what is captivating me is actually Krishna. Is It is a spark of Krishna that is manifesting over here. So learn to become conscious of Krishna in the things that make us unconscious of Krishna. Unconscious of Krishna, I mean, normally when we are captivated by some temptation, we just don't think about Krishna at all. So similarly, when there is a great threat, say a, a pandemic has swept across the world, or say um, we might have, we live in a place where there's a threat of a storm or threat of things like that. So even the destructive power of nature, ultimately it reminds us of how there are realities bigger than us, and nature is manifesting, working under Krishna's control. So many times when people experience natural calamities, they see this is a, like a godlike power. This is scary. This is, this it just jolts us out of our daily conceptions and daily routines. So whenever something just grips our attention, rather than simply letting our attention get caught in it, we can think and understand, okay, this is manifesting a spark of Krishna's splendor. Now, we may not remember it at that time, but even if we remember it before, even if we remember it after, at least that remembrance of Krishna is there. So that is, makes us conscious of Krishna. Now, Prabhupada writes in one of the purports in this same section 7.8 to 12 that the jurisdiction of Krishna ex extends everywhere and one who knows this is fortunate. So the jurisdiction of Krishna, so Krishna is not, some people have this idea that this whole world is profane. Profane is the opposite of sacred. It's unholy, it is impure. And God is pure. And we need to give up the impure to go toward the pure. Well, that's, yes, we definitely need to ourselves become purified. But to consider the world to be profane is a, a profane or impure is a, incorrect understanding. The jurisdiction of Krishna extends everywhere. Even in what we consider normally the profane world, there also Krishna's jurisdiction is there. And if you can pursue that Krishna connection, then we are fortunate. So this was a broad thing. We need to see everything in the life of life's ultimate purpose. Then how do we deal with things that distract us from life's purpose? So one of the major distractors is sex and the attraction between the male and the female that eventually leads to sex. So this particular section, I'm going to discuss this topic. Now, Dharma aviruddho bhuteshu kamosmi bharatarshaba. Krishna says, I am sex life that is not contrary to religious principles. So how can sex life be related with life's ultimate purpose? So what is sex pursued for? If you want to consider that, broadly speaking, let's before we start with the human beings, let's start with animals or let's start with nature in general. The primary purpose of sex is reproduction. So if somebody has lived in a, say a cow farm or something like that, where cows are taken care of, then there are biological or there are um, biological cycles or environmental cycles, there are say cows go into the heat. And when they are in the heat, 
they start exhibiting certain behavior certain symptoms and at that time uh, they they need to be united with the bull uh, and when the cow and the bull come together then then uh, then conception happens and eventually uh, reproduction happens so this is if we consider an animal world it is largely biologically triggered that there are certain hormones that start getting secreted in the body and they are of course associated with certain seasons certain cycles in the environment but the point is in nature sex is primarily a means for reproduction so there is union copulation leads to procreation to reproduction and of course there are a few organisms which reproduce without which reproduce asexually but that's very very few especially as consciousness develops now if we consider the microscopic organisms like bacteria and others or we consider plants even in plants say there is no there is no literally a physical union that is there in animals you now there are reproductive seeds there is a plants have the androecium the flower the androecium and the gynoecium and then the seeds are the pollen is blown by the winds from by the wind from one flower to another and when they fall at the right place from one plant to another then the reproduction happens so basically the soul evolves through various species and the lower the species in which the soul is present the less is the expression of consciousness just like in microscopic organisms or even in plants the expression of consciousness is very limited and when the expression of consciousness is very limited then the pleasures associated with the expression of consciousness are also very limited so um, so there, there is practically no no kind of sexual pleasure that is also, that is there in animals so there is reproduction so the point i'm making is reproduction is something which is pursued by all living beings it's essential for survival and as the consciousness develops uh, in the natural world in various species one one of the major ways the the way in which the standard way in which reproduction is pursued is through sex so now but rep while reproduction is a purpose there are a couple of other purposes also when we let's come to human society among various species in nature the human progeny requires the most care and the longest care as compared to other species mm. so there are there are if we consider birds sometimes birds they they lay eggs and then they sit on the eggs till the eggs hatch sometimes there are some species say if you consider seagulls or some other uh, aquatic you know they just uh, have their progeny and they go away and sometimes the progeny and the parent don't even see each other much so so there are different ways in which how much the newborn progeny depends on its uh, progenitors on its parents uh, for in its formative years or in its infancy that varies from species to species but a human progeny a human baby after it is born it's completely helpless now if a baby were abandoned all alone then the baby just wouldn't survive so by nature's arrangement pair bonding pair bonding refers to uh, two members of a species those who come together for reproducing there is a bonding that is formed between the two and pair bonding is what enables the couple to be united together so that they can carry on the responsibility of reproduction and of course there is pleasure so there is the <clears throat> release of there is the activation of hormones and release of certain fluids in the body and there is a intense sensation of pleasure that is there when one unites for the process of sex so now if we consider broadly these three purposes the primary purpose is reproduction that is what human beings that is how human beings survive and reproduce 
the remaining two purposes are like add-ons which are meant to assist in the first so pair bonding and pleasure that means so as i said the male and the female in the human species have to uh, take responsibility take care of their progeny and unless they are reasonably bonded together then they cannot do that so the uh, more in more say polite circle the word for sex that uses physical intimacy now physical intimacy or pair bonding the point of that is what that when the two people are together then when they take on the responsibility of having a child then they can take care of the child and the bhagavatam in its third canto says that the whole process of uh, bonding with another human being the whole process of taking care of a third human being all this involves a significant level of anxiety and responsibility and unless there were some pleasure people would not take it up so so the pleasure is given within nature to and it helps to mitigate the anxiety coming from uh, the what, what is associated pair bonding and reproduction so now of course when we bond with a human being that itself gives some pleasure when we uh, when we see a child and the child grows up to become a wonderful human being that also gives some pleasure uh, there's no it's not that pleasure is only in the sexual act but the point is that there is a significant amount of anxiety that comes up with it so now if we consider broadly the purpose is why certain things are done in more, if you consider in traditional society as well as compared to modern society in traditional society it was understood that reproduction is the primary purpose now of course people wanted to people wanted to also have a life partner there was a pair bonding and of course there was a hope for that pleasure hope for pleasure but if you consider uh, say the bhagavatam or if you can even consider uh, germanic sagas from uh, sagas from europe and other places often kings would have anxiety about having a heir now, who will succeed who will carry on my response carry on the responsibilities in fact uh, even now people say uh, uh, people from uh, one or two generations before us they often have this anxiety you know who will carry on our dynasty who will carry on our legacy uh, who, who will carry on the name of our dynasty that's why they say that you need to procreate that is considered to be one of the duties within the uh, duties to our ancestors within the vedic broad vedic tradition so now sometimes people from the modern people who are affected too much by the modern and the post modern views well what is this point of continuing one's dynasty what does it even mean it doesn't make any it doesn't make sense because you know we often have got a very fragmented view of ourselves and our life that we think of ourselves as just one tiny uh, we consider ourselves as entirely autonomous units capable of doing whatever we want and we feel that we deserve the freedom to do whatever we want but we are not entirely autonomous we exist in various larger units we we'll exist in a dynasty we we are a part of a dynasty we are a part of a nation we are a part of a community and each of these brings certain duty with it so traditionally marriage and producing uh, children there is a sanctity associated with it because that's how one continues on the existence of the human species and also continues on one particular dynasty so we are living because of all that our ancestors did in the past and then we need to pass it on to a future generation we can to continue the dynasty so <clears throat> the idea was that say <clears throat> sometimes the pleasure is so uh, the pleasure motive can dominate and drive people so sometimes people so pair bonding the ritual for pair bonding is marriage and so traditionally union uh, union between man and woman would happen after marriage so through a formal bonding through formal pair bonding happens through uh, through marriage and then people 
take up the responsibility of having children. <clears throat> but it could happen at times in the past that, say, a man and a woman get very strongly attracted to each other, and when they get attracted, uh, they may even without uh, without formalizing uh, their relationship through a sacred marriage, they might just uh, unite. But when that would happen, what people would understand, if especially pregnancy happens after that, then they would understand you have to take responsibility. And then they would get married. So that would be called, there is a word called shotgun marriages. Shotgun marriages means that you know, the father of the girl would stand with a shotgun before the, behind the head of the boy, the man. And he says, you know, you have to take responsibility. And now this is, all this is a very elaborate subject, but I'll just mention this briefly. Um, see that in the past, the, the institution of marriage was considered to be extremely important and sacrosanct, sacred. And uh, sometimes almost the institution of marriage mattered as much as, or if not more than the person to whom somebody was getting married. I repeat this, the institution of marriage mattered as much or if not more than the person to whom somebody was getting married. That means that if I am married, then I am committed. I have to take responsibility. I have to make sure we make this thing work. So now, uh, <clears throat> where uh, it's not that in the past when marriages were arranged, it's not that people were always happy in all the marriages. But when the primary purpose was clearly understood, okay, you know, this is a responsibility and this is a sacred responsibility. Then the other purpose is, okay, how well do I get along with this person? How much pleasure do I get in bonding with this person? Now those were secondary. But when the, sec when, so the, when the primary purpose of reproduction is put aside, and then what is sought is pair bonding. Now pair bonding and pleasure, how I'm separating it is, pair bonding is more of an emotional connect with the other person. Pleasure is more of a physical stimulation uh, that comes to the actual act of copulation. So now if we consider when the, the, the primary purpose of reproduction is put aside, then all that matters is pair bonding or pleasure. So then when it is pers when any activity in, in, a, in general, we could see this as a universal principle that any activity which is not pursued for some higher purpose, which is not pursued with a sense of a positive responsibility, that soon devolves into meaninglessness. Hmm? Say for example, when pleasure is divorced from pair bonding for procreation, then gradually the pleasure starts becoming pointless. What do you mean the pleasure starts becoming pointless? That in the 90, from the 1960s onwards, especially in America and in general in the in European in Europe in the Western culture, there was what is called as the sexual revolution. So there was psychologist like Sigmund Freud who said that you know, people were from the start of the last century started having a lot of mental problems. Now these mental health problems were caused by various issues. Urbanization led to uprooting of people from their traditional settings where they lived and had a sense of belonging the the, the industry the further the commercialization industrial urbanization commercialized industrialization made let people to feel lonely and uh, uh, ultra competitive environment various things came up but freud had this idea that people are having mental health problems now again freud wrote a lot of things and i don't want to oversimplify what he said but it's only what is relevant to us he said that most people's mental health problems are because of sexual repression, repressed desires of the libido. And therefore, what is the solution? Some people felt the solution was just unrestricted sexual expression. And they felt that marriage and all these things, you know, they don't allow us to express love freely. And so there's a sexual revolution came up where, uh, where sex was separated from marriage 
and now of course in the western and westernized world it's uh, it's uh, it's quite common for people to to you know uh, to come together without any even any thought of marriage but then what happened because of that uh, harvard medical school did a survey in the 1990s and they have repeated that into in the uh, it's just one survey but many other surveys also have done this that people who were the who lived through this free sex culture often they felt themselves very lonely and guilty lonely because although their bodies were coming in touch with many other bodies but their hearts were remaining untouched and they knew that they were just simply using somebody else to relieve an itch and other that other person was using them to relieve an itch and eventually what happened was that the sexual pleasure itself became pointless and this is the irony that the more sex is glamorized the more it is trivialized glamorized means what that in in general in the in the past traditional cultures uh, sexual activity was not publicly depicted whether it was india or whether it was the west you know, physical intimacy and acts associated with physical intimacy were not generally publicly depicted they were done privately but now public depiction happens and there is a whole huge sense of mystique associated with it as if something extraordinary something wonderful is going to happen but it's ironic uh, the more the media glamorizes sex the more in real life sex is trivialized trivialized means what that there are there are cases of people you know, who go to a bar drink pick up someone and the next morning they don't even know the name of the person with whom uh Uh, they they had they had sex so it it becomes something very trivial so it's ironic the more we glamorize it in our imagination the more it is uh, it in real life it just becomes trivial however we may treat sex trivially in the sense trivial in the sense that you know i will do whatever i want with whoever i want but sex is not a trivial thing it is actually very powerful it is too powerful to be humanly tamed and one example of this is the contemporary me too movement the me too movement arose because many women who were in the workplace uh, reported came out and reported that they were they were being sexually exploited by their employers or by people in people in the positions of power so now this is reprehensible wherever it was done simultaneously it reveals something deeper what does it reveal see we now the mainstream idea is that you know sex is just personal and enjoyable and if i want to do it the common the common aggressive saying of uh, of uh, of people who want who are pioneers of the sexual revolution they said that you now get your religion out of my bedroom Now, i want to do what i want to do and you should interfere with it so okay uh, if that's what you, you want that's what you got to some extent but the problem is that so sex is almost considered to be like any other recreational pleasure you know i might eat some food i might watch some movie i might do this so this is also an enjoyable activity and who are you to police that that's true who uh, you could you could come if somebody wants to think like that they have the freedom to think like that but is it really as casual as that there are movies which show that there are say uh you know say there are two friends one friend goes and watches a football match another friend goes and goes to a goes to a bar and picks up uh, picks someone and uh, does something and goes ahead and does something and the next day both of them say oh i had a wonderful time so the the mainstream media often portrays that there are many enjoyable activities and sex is one such enjoyable activity but is it just simply some something like that now if say if, so the, if somebody forced us to go and watch a movie we say we are not interested in football but somebody says come and let's watch football now 
would somebody else be if somebody forced somebody else to watch football would that person be 20 years down the line making a court case about that hey you forced me to watch football no obviously okay it's a few hours it's over but you know sex is not like that although the media portrays it just i am autonomous being and i can do whatever i want and who are you to regulate that so in real life sex is treated as just one among various enjoyable activities the life has like a menu of various enjoyable activities and sex may often fall on the top in that for people or somewhere at the top but is it simply like that it's not so it's not because you know, we even if we don't want to there is a lot of investment of personal emotion and a lot of investment of uh, a sense of personal privacy involved in that it is sex is overall too powerful a force to be humanly tamed so the media glamorizes sex with a mis mystique but it also trivializes it by saying you just do it whenever you want wherever you want but then it's not like that so to take it now so traditionally sex is regulated not because it is considered to be sinful but because it is recognized to be powerful it is extremely powerful force and yes now the urge for sex can sometimes make people do wrong things terribly wrong things also like in the case of say sexual exploitation that might happen but the but in the past when sex was regulated why was it regulated because its power is recognized it's like uh, in terms in if you want to make a rough comparison just like among weapons of mass destruction nuclear weapons fall in a different category now you can have guns you can have uh, you can have knives you can have bayonets you can have spears you can have tear gas but a nuclear weapon is an entirely different category so nuclear weapons are kept very carefully not anybody and everybody can have access to it and there are multiple protocols associated with uh, who will be able to activate those weapons and there is a great anxiety across the world that some rogue actors some terrorists that they don't get access to nuclear weapons because they can break havoc so we could say similarly among pleasures sex is extremely powerful and that's why traditionally access to it was regulated by various means and so in that sense uh, now what is the power of it that is the it the power within sex is that it can bring new life into the world now, there are many enjoyable activities but if somebody eats food now what happens after eating food you know, a few hours later we just pass it out that's all that is there of course in the mean, mean meanwhile it, it gives us strength and that is a positive but no other enjoyable activity or other activities that people pursue as enjoyable is associated with something as as consequential as this so in modern society what has happened is the the primary purpose has been relegated to almost incidental or non essential and that is a complete disruption of the natural order so there is people pursue it for pair bonding and not even for pair bonding it is just for pleasure and this the something which is sacred something which is powerful if it is not regulated properly then it can it can break havoc and that's what we are seeing happening more and more in society it's ironic that if you consider surveys between 1960s and say 2010 or 2015 <clears throat> there is a book uh, many books like that but there's one book which called the american paradox the misery amid plenty anxiety amid plenty so there are many surveys done which show that freedom or liberty or whatever it is called it is not necessarily associated with greater happiness the anxiety that people have has increased substantially and overall not only marriages become less stable 
but overall more and more people are afflicted with loneliness so we when we when we we don't understand the higher purpose and then we divorce something from the higher purpose then it can create havoc within life so the second so i just took, so this is the second part i took sex as an example of one thing that can it, it, it takes us away from purpose from life's ultimate purpose and how to deal with that and how to harmonize things with life's ultimate purpose so seeking pleasure is not the problem seeking pleasure contrary to life's purposes we are all pleasure seeking but we are not just pleasure seeking creatures we want meaningful pleasure we discussed this earlier in 522 yahi samsparsh jab hoga i mentioned how if somebody told us you have no financial anxiety no social responsibilities for the rest of your life just watch comedies now normally we might enjoy watching comedies but after some time we'll just get bored with it why because we want meaning we want purpose so, so some, the same principle applies to everything else including sex when when somebody pursues pleasure without considering life's purpose in fact in a way that is contrary to life's purpose it leads to a lot of problems so now when there is the male female attraction <clears throat> now often when india and indian culture is talked about sometimes uh, in in the western world the india is known mo more as the land of the kama sutra than the yoga sutra or the bhagavad gita and sometimes people critique that oh india modern india is very puritanical but traditional india was more open to sensuality and all that but the point is that if you look at kama sutra the point of it is that it is again dharma aviruddho bhuteshu kamo asmi bharadarsham it is not that there are generations and generations of spiritual teachers who have written commentaries on kama sutra the kama kama or sexual desire is a part of human life and vatsyan mumi himself says that that this kama should not be pursued independent of dharma artha and moksha this is one aspect of human life and that aspect has to be pursued now sometimes while pursuing that people may go overboard so when we look at mutual attraction between people so some people might even say that there are some traditional temples in india where there are some explicit depictions so why is that there so there, there are various reasons for it but i won't go into specifics but broad principle is so there is there are when the male female attraction is talked about there are different degrees to it there is romantic there is erotic and there is pornographic so romantic means that it's a male and a female are attracted to each other and when they are attracted to each other that is for forming a relationship and within that relationship there is a physical dimension to it also so for example traditionally if a, a woman's attractiveness is to be described it might be described in terms of her beauty a man's attraction and attractiveness is to be described it might be described in terms of his chivalry or his strength and romantic attraction is quite often talked about even in the vedic literature and arjuna saw subhadra he got attracted to her and he wanted to unite with her there are whole story there is the shakuntala story which is based on romantic attraction but the point is that in that in the romantic attraction means there is a that is a physical side to it but it's only one side it's more of a relationship that is developed and eventually two people want to have a life together in erotic descriptions uh there is a inordinate emphasis on the physical so uh, so in romantic it's more of a relationship with the person in erotic the sexual descriptions become more explicit and what we call as porn or pornographic today it's, there is no context of any relationship at all there is no consider or consideration of procreation there is no consideration of pair bonding it is just is objectifying the other person for one's own pleasure and this kind of things are this third category is where you rem, we earlier talked about the three per, three broad purposes so where it is just seen as a source of pleasure and this is dehumanizing so whatever is described 
at any places in the scripture sometimes even in the bhagavat even the bhagavatam or in the ramayana you might we might encounter certain explicit descriptions but they are primarily in a romantic context or some texts might have a slight erotic tone but we shouldn't equate all descriptions about the sexual features as immediately associated with pornography now pornography involves basically triggering people's desires so that they can be manipulated for one's own purposes so now i'll conclude with the last part what is the difference between lust and love so that so if you consider in the previous three things uh, romantic erotic pornographic so pornographic is literally driven only by lust lust is self centered where we where the, the other person is reduced to a mere bag of particular color or shape to be bent and uh, penetrated for one's own purpose to be exploited for one's own purpose so there is very little consideration of the other person even as a conscious being in contrast love is service centered it is purpose centered the purpose of service where we see the other person as a part of god and meant to be a comrade in facing life's battles in the bhagavatam this vision is there for example the third uh, in the third fourth cantos there are descriptions where one place where it says one spouse is one's best protector from the attack by the plundering senses so one spouse is like a fort and when the senses are the plunderers which come in attack then the idea is life's battles everybody faces battles we all get tempted in various ways and uh, we can't reject all pleasure but that pleasure is sought within uh in in a sacred context where life's ultimate purpose is being pursued then that becomes like a fort for us so love is service centered where we see the other person as a person whom we want to care for whom we want to do something for so we talked earlier about material and spiritual relationships in material relationship when i see when we see someone the first thought that comes in what can this person do for me in spiritual relationships the first thought is what can i do for this person so the same thing can apply to lust and love and actually every relationship is a reciprocation and if we do something for someone we also expect them to do something for us however the primary impetus is not so much pleasure without caring for the other person it is and it is not just caring for the other person as a means for my pleasure but rather caring for the person other person as a as a complete being as at a core a spiritual being on a spiritual journey so when <clears throat> when sex is pursued in this holistic with this holistic understanding then the soul the two two living beings two human beings can become co-creators with god can become co-creators with god in bringing new life into the world and that is something which is associated with a lot of sanctity and potency that is what krishna says that is the sex life that is not contrary to spiritual principles to to the that is that is, that experience of sex is krishna himself he is saying that that is the experience of god through sex so the gita's inclusive message is that god can be experienced through everything even seemingly non spiritual things such as sex and war now why are we talking about war over here because in the immediate context of the gita krishna will tell arjuna to fight a war and arjuna will fight that war and even in the so war or sex these are considered to be very materially involved things but krishna says that god can be experienced even through this uh, but when the primary purpose of life is the pursuit of dharma then everything else can be incorporated within that primary pursuit so this is the inclusive vision of the gita i'll summarize what we discussed today and then we can have a few question answers so i spoke on the theme of Uh, can sex be spiritual and what is the difference between lust and love 
so i started by talking first about this section of the gita is focusing on not rejection of the world but connection through the world an inclusive message not just detach your mind from matter but see krishna within the material world and krishna is the essence of everything and that was the theme which we discussed how krishna is the essence of various things in the world the three parts how to first we understand life's ultimate purpose and see everything in the light of ultimate light of light of that ultimate purpose our ultimate purpose is spiritual evolution to connect with krishna and the various objects of this world they they affect our spiritual evolution sometimes we may get attracted toward them so everything attractive manifests a spark of krishna's splendor and if we get attracted to him uh, get attracted to those objects remembering that they are actually manifestations of krishna then we will be able to process so we talked about the ocean and there are various drops of water those drops which take us toward the ocean are the drops we should pursue not the drops that take us away from the ocean so everything attractive comes from krishna but everything attractive doesn't take us toward krishna uh, we don't the things that take us away from krishna we don't have to condemn or demonize them but we need to understand that okay what is attractive within this for me it is krishna and krishna is best experienced through direct devotional sources not through this source so learn to become conscious of krishna in the things that make us unconscious of krishna and the jurisdiction of krishna ex extends everywhere then the second part was what what do we do with the things that distract us from life's purpose so as an example we discussed sex so what are the purposes why people indulge in, why why sex is indulged in so if you look at the broad living beings broad, broad life on the planet sex is primarily for procreation and there are biological and uh, environmental cycles within which other living beings feel impelled to have sex and then they have it and they procreate through that now in human beings apart from procreation there are other aspects also significantly involved one is pair bonding human progeny require far more care than most other progeny require most other species progeny require and that's why there has to be a significant uh, coming together of the parents so that they can take care of the children and this pair bonding is traditionally done through rituals like uh, marriage and then there is of course pleasure now pair bonding and uh, procreation there is a certain amount of anxiety and uh, responsibility associated with that so to mitigate that there is some pleasure arranged by nature but in today's world <clears throat> the secondary purposes are made primary and the primary is relegated to not to non essential and even undesirable but when in the name of sexual freedom in the sexual revolution pleasure was sought independent of pair bonding and procreation and what happened people became extremely lonely the media glamorizes sex and champions sexual freedom but ironically the more sex is glamorized in the media the more it becomes trivialized in real life trivialized in the sense that oh there are many enjoyable activities and just as somebody may watch a movie somebody may go to a sports match others become so casual and they have physical relationship with someone but sex is a extremely powerful force and uh, it is powerful because it has the power to bring new life into the world but beyond that also there is a investment of emotional uh, of emotions within it and in this power just like nuclear power it is used indiscriminately it can devastate so similarly sex is powerful and traditionally it was regulated not because it was considered to be looked down upon or sinful but because its power was recognized when that power is not recognized and sex is sought or given indiscriminately then we have the backlash coming up in the form of uh, say movements like me too nobody would protest 20 years down the line if they were forced to watch a sports match but if uh, they are sexually abused there's a vehement protest because you know it's not as casual or as trivial as is made out it is just a it's not just a physical pleasure alone so then we discussed how can sex be integrated with life's ultimate purpose 
so uh, sex provides living beings the opportunity to become co-creators with god and for that sex is done within the is pursued within the boundaries of dharma and there are descriptions of sexual there are sexual there seem to be sexually ex explicit descriptions even within the broad uh, indian culture or indian literature so we discuss that those descriptions what are they there is romantic where the focus is on the relationship but then there are the physically attractive features are also talked about then there is erotic where the physical description become more explicit and pornographic is where there is no conception of relationship of, of pair bonding or reproduction it is only only the objectification and exploitation of the other person for one's own pleasure and that is uh, that is to be completely it is that is that is a uh, very unhealthy so we discuss the difference between lust and love is lust is very self centered we reduce the other person to simply a uh, object to be manipulated for one's own pleasure and love is where it's service centered we see the other person as a partner as a comrade in life's battles and within this spiritual understanding if one uh, uh, pursues one's sexuality then then the through sex also one can pursue life's purpose and experience god so the gita's message is that god is so inclusive that even through activities it seem non devotional non spiritual such as sex or war god can be experienced if god is the ultimate purpose of what we are doing thank you very much hare krishna are there any questions so when i say that we can connect with krishna through activities that disconnect us from him then can we connect with him through gambling and stealing also no and I, what i said was very careful i mentioned that prabhupad said that it is if while if somebody cannot give up drinking alcohol then they can while drinking alcohol they can think of krishna it is not drinking alcohol that will take them toward krishna but it is remembering krishna that will gradually help them grow spiritually and they grow spiritually till they eventually become connected with krishna and then they attain krishna so the idea is that the remembrance of krishna is what is going to take us toward krishna those particular activities won't take us toward krishna but sometimes we just become so frustrated now this particular activity is uh, is i'm trying to give it up i'm not able to give it up and it is pulling me so much what do i do and we become very frustrated and disheartened by that but we need to see that that activity is attracting us because a spark of krishna is being manifested over there and we need to see how that spark can be that, that whatever is the spark over there krishna is that pole so how can i connect with krishna more holistic more uh, congenially more attractively more holistically and that connection with krishna is what will help us to come toward him so that devotional connection can be reinforced by properly seeing the things that disconnect us not by engaging in those things okay now if everything comes from krishna does everything unattractive also come from krishna yes of course does that mean is there a contradiction with krishna is all attractive no <clears throat> krishna is all attractive but depending on how much something becomes disconnected from krishna to that extent it manifests or does not manifest krishna's all attractiveness so just as for example the sun is the source of light but the further we go away from the sun or the further we turn away from the sun the more we see darkness Now, there would be no darkness if there were no sun because the concept of light and darkness are there because first the sun is there so the we could say darkness exists because the sun exists but darkness doesn't exist darkness is not itself caused by the sun darkness is caused by one's turning away from the sun or going away from the sun so similarly 
when people uh, when say suppose somebody is unattractive in a particular way whatever way it may be physical it may be personality it may be whatever now we understand that that is a result of uh, one's own past karma and uh, this is not meant to demonize the person but you just to un understand that contextually and why did they do those kar that particular karma which has got the reaction in this form that's because they were they were captivated by something which is which is uh, disconnected from krishna so they did some activities which were uh, involving negative karma and they were impelled to those activities because they got captivated by certain things which uh, were separated from krishna so in that sense everything comes from krishna but not everything reflects krishna's attractiveness how much it will reflect krishna's attractiveness depends on how close it is to krishna or how far it is from krishna the further it is the less and less it will reflect krishna's attractiveness can we say that the extent of care that a species needs is related with the level of intelligence of the species so the more the intelligence the more the the fish just leave their babies and go away birds care a little bit but human beings um, have to care for almost eight to eighteen years yes uh, there is a very interesting analysis uh, of how much characteristics in a particular species are inherited and how much are developed or cultivated so the lower the species the more it functions largely by inherited characteristics so for example um if a dog is a pet dog and a dog is taught certain skills does that mean that the if the dog procreates and produces a baby dog will that baby dog learn all the tricks well not really the baby dog may grow up in an environment where if if the dog baby dog is also with the parent then they may might be able to learn it faster um so what does it mean practically that in the lower species the things that we learn they are relatively few and the things that we learn are not carried on to the next species so most of what what most of the behavior of dogs is determined by the inherited characteristics whereas in human beings when we consider human behavior what distinguishes people is largely their acquired characteristics isn't it when we when we meet with a person then we see how they speak how they behave now there are certain aspects of inherited characteristics within them but the language that they learn the mode in which they speak much of this is learned through during one's life so the inherited characteristics may create a certain foundation from which one moves forward but the acquired characteristic shapes one's behavior significantly and that means that acquiring these characteristics is also a part of the training that the living being has so so overall because human being human behavior is shaped a lot by acquired characteristics and those acquired characteristics uh take time to develop and require training to develop so in that sense human beings ultimately the ultimate training is required to pursue spiritual growth and attain uh develop on spiritual love for krishna so humans are arranged by nature in such a way that the the a significant amount of care is required so that the acquired characteristics which comprise intelligence and which comprise cultured behavior they are properly learned thank you it's best to have one question at a time so i'll answer some questions now 
why is uh, why is divorce divorce become so prevalent and marriages become so unstable mm, why do people want to engage more in illicit ways what is the practical solution for this well, this is very complicated mm, but i'll talk about this three broad aspects one is the cultural glamorization of sex and often the the demonization or the ridicule or derision the demonization or derision associated with traditional regulation to to sexuality so often whatever the traditional regulations where they are considered to be old fashioned primitive moral policing and all such words are used by which people think that they are doing something special say for example the human urge to 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 look for sensual pleasures has been there throughout history but in say in modern movies uh, often when there are some explicit scenes uh, that they, they are called as bold scenes now is that really bold it is basically it is basically being uh, it's just being explicit but when by calling it as bold what happens is the opposite of bold is cowardly that means somebody who dresses in a traditional way somebody who is they are are they cowardly and those who are dressing in explicit way are they bold so when language is is manipulated the, cult, the culture broadly depicts uh, depicts the glamorization of sexuality as a uh, as very vividly and that always makes people crave for something that is not normally available so what happens when sex was associated with marriage then one's mind is always imagining oh there is this so much pleasure so much pleasure so much pleasure but okay one gets married one engages in that activity gets some pleasure but afterward one understands okay you know, my mind was just hyper imaginary my was just this excessive imagination and the reality is different from that imagination but when there is constant bombardment of sexuality then people start thinking that actually not that sex doesn't give pleasure but the but the sex, the person with whom i am doing sex that is not giving me pleasure so maybe i should try with someone else and try with someone else so rather than getting some realization and getting some renunciation the constant sexual stimulation uh, gives people so many alternatives and they think the next alternative would be better than what i have in present and that that so the constant cultural glamorization of sex that is one major reason why uh, why marriages are breaking down because people feel that they will they will get something better somewhere else so why restrict themselves to marriage the second factor is that um, the way modern society has worked out whereby um, people are reduced to economic to units production units within the economy so modern economy is not the, so modern socio economic structures are not very marriage friendly so if people are educated in such a way that they consider the that the, their primary self worth is going to come through the amount of money they are earning it is going to come through the position they had they have risen in their corporate world then marriage especially marriage which will lead to procreation see unless marriage is associated with uh, with with the fulfillment that comes from taking care of children there is a certain amount of fulfillment in that if that is not there then the the commit the long term commitment to one person required in marriage that doesn't seem worth it and what happens especially this is related to women if there is a lot of areas in which uh, in the modern culture it is said the men and women are equal but you know women alone have that super power to bring new life into the world and when they this when women are taught to just put aside that 
that's unique power that they have and to try to be good or better than be equal to or better than men in the corporate world then what happens then one of the key things associated with marriage that is pregnancy that is seen simply as a career obstacle oh if i get pregnant then i lose 2 3 years or 5 years and i have to take care of the children and then that is one of the major incentives for staying in a committed relationship that committed that incentive is also lost so the socio economic uh, now the, we can't change the cultural glamorization but we can minimize our exposure to the cultural glamorization of sex so we also can't change the socio economic structure of society but we needn't buy into the the definitions of success that society brings about that that society foists upon us now it is not that for a woman to be successful she has to necessarily rise the same way up the corporate ladder that uh, that men rise men and women are different women are more interested in relationships and that is that is nature's arrangement by which they can care for small babies you know unless the women have that heightened emotional sensitivity babies who can't express themselves through words how can mothers take care of them so that buying into the corporate the the media, the socio economic definition of success that also leads to a lot of uh disimpetus for having children and therefore for having a long term relationship and one last factor <clears throat> which is to be also considered is that overall if there is no understanding of a spiritual purpose for life that if we think relationships are only for pleasure then if i don't get pleasure what is the point of being in the relationship but if there is a broader understanding that relationships have a higher purpose that um, two people are together not just for material physical gratification but for spiritual evolution then whatever challenges we face in the relationship there is some reason to deal with those challenges and okay you know i have to i have to tolerate i have to grow as a spirit as a human being i have to grow as a spiritual being and the challenges in this relationship which will teach me humility which will teach me tolerance which we which will which will help me to become more sensitive to other person other person's perspectives and there is a reason to do, deal with all that but if i think i am entering into a relationship only for pleasure then i think okay if the pleasure is not there what is the point of being in this relationship instead of pleasure i am only getting trouble so why continue so the lack of of a spiritual purpose for life also leads to the destabilization of marriage so when prabhupad says that marriage licit or legal or illegal it is always troublesome it leads to obstacle in krishna consciousness in household life the advancement is almost nil and chaitanya mahap also says nadhanam na janam na sundarim so how do we understand all this again context is critical for understanding any subject so oh, if if the statement is to be taken literally that na sundarim chaitanya mahaprabhu says or prabhupada says nil spiritual advancement in uh, in household life then we look at the tradition almost all the great sages were householders we see vashishta muni was a householder we see even shungi was a son of shamik rishi who was a householder and there are so many great sages were all householders so were they not pursuing spiritual advancement no they were they were definitely pursuing spiritual advancement so the point here is that one shouldn't become infatuated so when he says na dhanam na janam na sundarim the context of that verse is that these are considered to be desirable things in the world but chetan mahaprabhu is saying i don't consider them desirable i don't consider them that or rather not that i don't consider i don't i don't desire them what i desire is you and your devotional service o lord 
and that is why i want to do I, I, that is what i long for so it's not a it's not a condemnation it is the acknowledgement that this can be a distraction and therefore i don't want to get involved in it the bhagavatam is spoken to we have to always remember the context of the bhagavatam the bhagavatam is spoken to a person who is about to die and at that time everything worldly even if it is pious even if it is virtuous is a distraction but when parikshit maharaj was in householder life you know he doesn't he doesn't think of his householder responsibilities as distractions or burdens he does them diligently uh, and um, <clears throat> so the, so <clears throat> if in our tradition chaitanya mahaprabhu many of his associates in fact most of his associates were grahasthas so yeah, so the so when prabhupada talks about in grahastha ashram advancement is nil that is basically if one gets so infatuated in the grahastha ashram that one doesn't have any mental space or time for spiritual growth but uh, grahastha ashram is the traditionally recommended sacred way by which one can grow spiritually in fact the word ashram itself means a place where we get ashray of krishna our movement began the krishna consciousness movement began at a time when shila prabhupada most most of shila prabhupada's early followers k they were from the counter culture where there was no respect for the sanctity of marriage and uh, coming from that culture which was quite world rejecting but not in a transcendental way in a ignorant way you know, there was so getting into sex would mean getting into basically some kind of illicit sex so that would have been counterproductive so we cannot divorce prabhupada statements from the broad tradition in which he has come and the context in which he is speaking so we make spiritual advancement to the extent we are connecting our consciousness with krishna and if we are connecting our consciousness with krishna whatever ashram we might be in we can make spiritual advancement okay there are two questions let me take <clears throat> so what is licit and what is illicit sex mm. so vyasadev mm had children in other men's wives or parashar muni produced vyas dev it's not considered illicit okay this is a, again a big subject but in the past procreation was considered to be a primary purpose of union and procreation was a uh, was a sacred duty so there was a a there was a system within the tradition that if if say a part, somehow a particular in a particular dynasty the husband wife were not able to procreate and have a child uh, say in the case of pandu pandu was cursed that if he united with his if he united with his wife uh, if he ever sought A union, sexual union, he would die. Or in the case of Amba, Ambe, Ambika, and Ambalika, their husbands had passed away without having children. So at such times, there was a tradition that some other person, uh, either somebody who is related with them, like an in-law, or some other respectable person, would unite with them only for the purpose of procreation. There would be no long-term relationship, and. it was done under regulation and the whole purpose was only procreation so now is that illicit you know there is a authorization within scripture for that and the purpose of that was to to make sure that the dynasty goes on so these are exceptions and those exceptions are uh, for for ensuring that the dynasty goes on the dynasty continuation of the dynasty and ensuring the say the king has a successor a heir was considered a very important responsibility and lastly about the parashar muni producing vyasadev yes that was when parashar muni was with uh, <clears throat> this fisher woman in her boat 
so at that time yes he was attracted to her but that was not the only thing he also observed that that particular time the cosmological arrangement the 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 astronomical signs indicated that was a time when a great soul could be born into the world so that's why he united with her and the falena parichayate we see that a great say vyasadev was born from that so normally uh, sex within the context of marriage is what is considered licit in exceptional situations some other forms of sex might also be considered to be licit but those exceptions are exceptions there is the apavad the apavad is the exception the apavad uh, does not uh, um, reject or co contradict the standard the apavad is simply an apavad so there in real life there are subtleties and nuances and those have to be acknowledged when we are to consider the complexities of real life but the exceptions don't uh, don't reject the rule they don't don't contradict or reject the rule the exceptions are for exceptional situations so okay one last question mm. so in today's world there are a lot of mm, either you go to the extreme of becoming too attached to sex life or becoming too detached and irresponsible and the preaching to youth also by release organizing sometimes creates problems iskon has also contributed good and bad in its 50 years 50 or so years of existence the two things over here one is that scripture is always taught in a particular context by its particular teachers and how people understand it also depends on their particular minds so yes because the human mind especially in today's world it's very easy for the the mind in ignorance to fixate on one small thing and to make it into everything yattu krishna var ekasmin karye satyam ahetukam atatvatha dalpam chit tamasam udaharutam so in the modern world we come from a mainstream culture where sex is considered to be everything and that is that is the that is almost seen as the purpose of life and anything that interferes with the purpose of life is simply condemned and demonized and like i discussed in pornography uh, sex is divorced from from a relationship from procreation from everything else in contrast when people come to a spiritual organization especially a spiritual organization which also teaches renunciation then we might get fixated with the idea that oh this is something which is simply trouble and it has to be given up but there is a lecture of shri prabhupada where uh, for uh, where he is talking about a couple of disciples who are getting married he says and he says the purpose of marriage is to be happy in life now you this is such a radically different statement from what we might normally hear or normally hear as prabhupada's position that grahastha ashram is simply a place of uh, bondage and misery no no died no if two people come together properly within dharma you know they can have there's not life's ultimate happiness but they can have some happiness in that relationship and in the fulfillment that comes from executing responsibilities in that relationship so often just as there is a fixation on the on the glamorization of sex within materialistic culture there can be fixation on the demonization of sex within uh, within the spiritual culture and when that happens then that can lead to imbalance yes it can lead to problems so people who bring the uh, a too much of a ethos of renunciation into grahastha ashram where they don't there is a difference between attachment and commitment attachment is where our emotions are locked with no capacity for us to free the, those emotions so emotional entanglement or emotional imprisonment is attachment whereas commitment is emotional investment i use my god given intelligence and understand that this particular relationship or responsibility is important and i consciously invest my emotions in those relationships so when there is a, this 
simply there are two options that are thought there is attachment and there is detachment so if you don't have detachment then you are attached well life is not that simple to have the simply the black and white of attachment and detachment in between there can be commitment where there are emotions involved there are emotions are consciously invested but it is invested for a higher purpose so gradually it's uh, as devotees evolve in their understanding both devotees who are practicing and devotees who are teaching then we all move toward a, a more holistic understanding and that's why it's helpful that when we are practicing bhakti we may have one teacher one primary teacher but we but that primary teacher shouldn't be an exclusive teacher if we hear only from one person and don't hear from any other teachers then what happens is we uh, no matter how spiritually evolved that particular teacher may be they are they have one perspective of things and we start thinking we start equating that perspective with the only way to practice krishna consciousness that's why we have guru sadhu and shastra it's not just guru alone the guru is representing krishna but the guru is still one human being we need other teachers other teachers preceding teachers in the tradition or other contemporary teachers so when we learn to hear from different teachers and different perspectives within the tradition of course then we can get a more holistic understanding and then our practice will also become more balanced material more balanced uh, materially and more uh, fruitful spiritually thank you very much hare krishna shri prabhupad ki jai gaur bhakt brind ki jai tai gaur premanande